Hello everybody. Melissa Holm here with Elusive Productions and we're here in celebration of the recent May 2020 release of our seventh rock opera, The Rite of Saturn. And we're super excited about that. In honor of that, we're bringing to you this series of seven episodes. This is episode one of seven, where we regale you with the biggest learnings we've taken away from 20 years of The Rites of Eleusis. So the release of the Rite of Saturn marks the completion of the full set of seven rites. And you can find a link in the comments to uh, learn more about that from our website and the opportunity to download your own version of Saturn or any of the previous six available on our Vimeo site. It's a body of work that has spanned 20 years. And in addition to being super proud of the work that we've done, uh, we are taking this occasion to reflect over the last 20 years and, and answer the question that is frequently put to us. Many times we've been asked, what was your process in creating the rights of Eleusis as rock operas? And what did you learn from all of that? The short answer to this question is we learned a lot. Uh, the list of lessons that we've learned and skills that we've built through this process is long. And I can truthfully say that it has had a profound impact on the course of our lives. And we're really happy in this seven video series to be sharing with you the majority of the biggest things that we have learned. So let's talk about our process. Let's review what we've learned and talk about what are the key learnings and takeaways that we've taken that have um, the foundational principles through this 20 year process, creating the rights of Eleusis as rock operas. Number one, the first pancake. <sighs> Imagine us, John Sewell, my principal partner at Elusive, and myself sitting down to breakfast in 2004. We're talking about the Rite of Luna. We've just released our completed soundtrack. We have auditions scheduled to gather our supporting cast. And we've solicited the help of a friend with theater background to help us with the choreography. We have lots of ideas. What if the 963 was a full company dance number? What if Cancer and Taurus beat on massive gongs in order to like bang out the gematria instead of clapping or banging a stick or whatever? What if there was a big grotto on the stage full of trees and flowers and a big rock and a spring where Pan and the fairies and fawns would frolic? What if Luna was sleeping on her throne in the audience so that when we're singing to her and trying to get her attention, we're not turning our back on the audience and then the audience gets this full impact of our invocations? Yeah, we were full of ideas. And in our minds, they were usually imagined with the full support and stagecraft of technology, imagining what we would do if we could do anything, if we had the budget and everything they've got on Broadway. That's what was in our minds. Yet the reality was somewhat different. I remember leaving the first rehearsal for the Rite of Luna, having sent the choreographer off with the chorus while I was working with the principals. And everyone left at the end, some kind of tense smiles as they hug, oh yeah, we'll see you next week. And everyone leaves, and my choreographer turns to me gravely and says, there will be no footwork in this show. You see, these these actors were not dancers, apparently. And, and some of them weren't even really actors, either. They were, however, enthusiastic, could sing a song, and they were there for us. This was not the first time that we would grapple with the reality of things as they compared to the vision. At first, I struggled with it. I got really frustrated. Why couldn't everything come together as it did in my head? Why couldn't we raise enough funds to get the technical things that we wanted to incorporate, to get the big fancy theater, to have everything that we needed, the fancy costumes? But then over time, it became one of my favorite aspects of doing the rites. 
I would revel, of course, in the idea of spinning dreams, of creating big visions for what the rights would be. But I would really also learn to enjoy facilitating the process of what the rights would actually become. This is a classic example of the challenge of navigating the four Kabbalistic worlds. The model of the four Kabbalistic worlds is, at its simplest, a model of how ideas become reality. Based on the fourfold formula of the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vau -Hey, its application toward creation unfolds starting at the top of the tower here that I've drawn for you with Atzaluth, the archetypal world. This represents the will of deity, the highest aspect of creation wherein all possibilities dwell. From the archetypal springs the creative, or the world of Bria, the idea of the things that express the archetypal, imaginings, inspirations to create something more specific. What follows is the more tangible still in the formative world of Yetzirah. This is where the general ideas become specific, where parameters are set and plans are laid. And finally, we have Asiya, the material world, where the inspiration and planning become the real thing and can be experienced in the world. Let's see how we might apply these concepts at a high level to what we know of Aleister Crowley's creation of the rights of Eleusis in 1910. We know from his writings and stated intentions in developing organizations like AA and Ordo Templi Orientis that he was interested in communicating truth, at least as he saw it, that he was interested in gaining members from an interested public, and that he was often looking for funding to support his efforts. So the archetypal world might express these things as things that communicate truth, things that pique interest, and things that make money. After the success of a private group ritual, the Barcible working, one of Crowley's companions, Guy Marston, said, said to have suggested that Crowley should convert the event into some type of public spectacle and charge admission. This suggestion got Crowley to thinking, tapping into the creative world. I imagine it rolling out like a formula in his mind. Step one, ritual communicating truth through clear expression and evocation of the archetypal. Step two, theater, an art form that the public finds interesting and would be willing to pay for. Step three, profit. And by profit, I don't simply mean money. It's clear that money was frequently a motivator for Crowley as he was always looking for funding for his projects. He was also looking for members in his newly formed magical teaching order, AA. So Crowley started planning. He stepped into the formative world. He chose his medium and sources. It's been suggested that he chose the rites of Eleusis from antiquity as his inspiration for a couple of reasons. The educated public would be aware of those stories and the structure of the lesser and greater mysteries would lend itself well to his goal of using the rites as a starting point for people interested in joining the AA. A lesser mystery to the AA's greater mystery, if you will. He also built off of his previous success with the Bartzeville working by creating a prototypical ritual of the rite of Artemis to test with a larger group. Additionally, and something we'll talk about more in episode six of this series, he looked around at his friends and their particular talents and set about to use them to his greatest advantage. He himself, a poet and orator, Victor Newberg, a crazy ecstatic dancer who played a mean tom-tom, and Layla Waddell, a skilled violinist, were the talent pool upon which he built his rights of Eleusis. Best laid plans, right? The rights definitely did not work out as Curly intended them. After a decent first performance with many of its flaws obscured by spooky lighting, the performances declined in quality and the public perception went down with it as well. Bad press and strained relationships 
created a chain reaction of conflict that ended in court and in personal fallings out. Crowley said it best in an oft-quoted passage from Confessions. I throw myself no bouquets about these rites of Eleusis. I should have given more weeks to their preparation than I did minutes. I diminished the importance of the dramatic elements. The dialogue and action were little more than settings for the soloists. Now let's review the same thought process with the rites of Eleusis that we produced with Elusive Productions. The archetypal and creative levels are much the same, as we also have been drawn to the idea of communicating truth in a way that is interesting to people, and then ways that do it that might make money towards future projects. Now we shift into the creative world. As we have an interest in Crowley, the utilization of his body of work inspires us, but we see some barriers to the work's usefulness in reaching people. Some are in line with Crowley's own observation and others based on changes in Western culture. Parsing lengthy poems from the turn of the previous century is not a skill set in most people today. To address these, we decide to add music to our list of creative aspects, along with the addition of those dramatic elements that Crowley overlooked, like plot and character development, resolving to create content that more accurately reflects theatrical aspects of ritual theater. Now the planning begins. Going back to our breakfast conversations in the 2000 aughts, this is where we put up boundaries or scope to the work and get creative about what ways we would like to interpret and express the material. We resolve to leave the words and principal actions of Crowley scripts intact, even when the word choices and meter are awkward, which is often. And as we add character motivations and plot, we repeatedly will ask the question, does it serve the overall message of the rite? From a theatrical standpoint, what images do we want to create? What are we going to ask people to do and how can we communicate it? And then there is the material world how it actually plays out. In this, we have several parallels to how I map Crowley's experience. Fundraising was short of the goal and had to be supplemented by our personal funds and the generosity of cast members and crew who paid for their own costumes and expenses for building props. There was a long learning curve as we broke down detailed scenes involving 20 plus people with varying experience levels, a challenge that arose over and over again in all of the rites. We far exceeded the ticket sales that Crowley achieved in his run of all seven plays, but we did not make money. We also had some bad press, as one of the local pagan papers gave us a really bad review for the Rite of Luna. So why did we do it again? Great question. We did it again because in spite of all the challenges, we had a great time and got a lot out of it. And we resolved just as one does when they're making pancakes and the first one comes out a little weird to try again and to do it better. We looked at what we have done, took the feedback, engaged in some simple problem solving and gave it another go. So we've seen how the four Kabbalistic worlds illustrate how ideas become reality from the top down. Now let's look at it the other way. How can we use these concepts from the bottom up and how the interplay between each level can be utilized as a good problem solving framework? What happens when we try something and it doesn't turn out the way we wanted it to or how we thought it would? Sometimes people just give up and say, that didn't work, I guess I'm done. Other times, more tenacious types might say, that didn't work, let's do it again and see if it works this time. And then, well, you know the saying, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Trying again is great, but I want to point out an essential step that is often overlooked, that of examining what the actual problem is that is preventing you from success. Another way of putting it is to first get really clear on what is happening. Next, ask yourself what should be happening. 
This is the answer to the question, how will I know if I've succeeded? Or what does good look like? Now the problem you're trying to solve is the gap between these two things. Whatever experiment you undertake to try to meet your goal should be designed to take care of that gap. To use a different quote, one that I like much better, I'll cite Maya Angelou. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Take the example of fundraising that I spoke of a moment ago. When we first started out, we did fundraising for Elusive on a fairly small scale, asking friends and family to donate, creating fundraising events for preview shows and things like that. They didn't get us very far. Later, we tried selling videos, which funny enough, were not even a part of our original plan to create. Those helped a little bit, but they didn't fully meet the gap. So we looked at other marketing strategies. The advent of crowdfunding apps is a huge step in the right direction for us, and so on. The point is that we kept evaluating what we had set as our standard, we will fundraise enough money to cover our expenses, and every time we didn't meet our target, we would evaluate why, how well had our previous efforts worked, what could we do differently, etc. This is a basic problem solving structure that can be applied to anything in life. So simple, but so effective. Now, what if you continue to engage in problem solving at the material and formative levels and never seem to get there? The first answer is to keep working at it. And the second answer is maybe you need to look at it from a higher perspective. If you need to pivot at the creative level, maybe your motivations are good, your ideas are good, but the vehicle, the methodology that you have chosen to execute your plan is just not right for you to meet that goal. Really, that is up to you. But the point is, what we've learned over time with Elusive Productions is the more that we evaluate the connections between what is happening, what we think should be happening, and what the mission and the goal is of our project, the closer we get to achieving the vision that first comes out of our minds. So that's why we did it again, uh, and a little bit into the how we did it again and again and again. Uh, we had done it once, and we wanted to see how well we could do it. And I think we succeeded in improving every time by being open to examining how we met and didn't met our own expectations. Um, remember that list of ideas that I mentioned at the beginning of this video? Uh, some of them happened, some of them did not, and some of them sort of did, but in a different way from what we had originally had in mind in the original dream. Uh, the Rite of Luna is definitely our first pancake, um, and I hope you can enjoy this clip as an excerpt from the scene, The Priestess of Panermita, where you can see Pan telling a story to the nymph and satyr as he gazes through the audience at Luna, who is enthroned asleep at the back of the house. And uh, behind him, a troop of fairies and fawns enact the, in a stylized dance with no footwork the story that he is relating. Um, this video, our first video, The Rite of Luna, was created at cast request because manufacturing, creating, making these videos available was actually not a part of our original vision. Uh, and it had never been our intention to package and sell the rights until that request came in and we thought, why not? Uh, as you can tell in the clip, HD was not yet a thing available to us. And um, you can now play the first elusive drinking game with a drink of your choice. And whenever you see Jackie's blonde hairstyle change in this scene, you can take a drink. Up, down, up, down. Yeah, I could definitely say we learned a lot from this first pancake.
Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this first look into the seven top learnings of the Elusive Productions journey. And stay tuned for six more, including episode two, which I um, call Simplify, Do Not Embellish, a phrase that many of our cast members will recall me saying repeatedly through the last 20 years. Uh, for more information and links to acquiring full videos of the rights, including our latest release, The Right of Saturn, please refer to the link in the comments and have a great day.